Perfect. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you here. Uh, so this is our second session on um, conversations on inclusive teaching. And today we'll be talking about transparency in assignments and course design. Uh, so I'm Jen Weaver. I'm the Associate Director for University of Teaching at the CTLO. And I'm joined by Professor Suzanne Hall, who's the professor, sorry, the teaching professor of writing and director of the Hickson Writing Center. Did I get it right, Suzanne? Thank you. I've been practicing. Um, and Dr. Cassandra Horry, who's the Assistant Vice Provost and the director of the CTLO. Uh, and we'll hear from more, more from them shortly. So I'd like to welcome you to the second session today. Um, and we're going to kick it off by uh, Cassandra sharing a little bit about session plan and some foundational um, terminology. Yeah, welcome everyone. So following a short introduction about how you can engage today and some of that terminology, um, Jen and Suzanne will be talking with you about the power of goals and learning outcomes, um, transparent teaching in practice in a variety of different kinds of settings, um, and then some wonderful examples coming of using transparency in um, several different kinds of assignments that are pretty common at Caltech. And then finally, we'll have some time for application and discussion. And by the end of today, you will have the tools and skills and some practice um, in order to be able to develop and redevelop assignments for your course that have this quality of transparency. You'll be able to incorporate transparent teaching strategies into your course and your course syllabus. And um, we're looking forward to hearing also how you articulate really the mechanism behind how creating these transparent interactions can help students learning and their sense of belonging in your classes. So today, um, we really encourage you to engage with us. This is a framework that you're welcome to also use with your students. We use it often in our events and our teaching. And so you can change your Zoom name so that people know how to address you, how you'd like to be addressed. If you'd like, you may add your Zoom pro your pronouns to your Zoom, um, Zoom profile in the participants area. Please ask questions as we go. We'll be monitoring chat. We'll be looking for raised hands. You can do that in a variety of ways. If you're comfortable with it, we'd love to see you on video. Um, if not, again, chat and other ways are good ways to participate. Um, and then again, we'll be looking for all those different methods. So feel free to engage in any fashion that works. And most importantly, we're hoping that you really think critically with us about these methods and how you might use them um, and engage. Uh, take up some space, ask the questions, share your ideas, as well as making room for others to do the same. So to start out, we just want to ground our conversation in some of the common terms that are used around inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. Diversity is generally the sense of who's there, who's in the room, who's in the space, who's in our environment. Um, and that also has to do with who systemically has access to that space um, or that opportunity and who may be systematically excluded from those opportunities and environments. Inclusion takes it a step further and asks the question, well, who's contributing? contributions are really valued here, who's receiving explicit messaging that they actually do belong, that they're both not only present, but welcome in this, in this domain. We have some diagrams to maybe help metaphorize the concepts of equality, equity, and accessibility. You may have seen other diagrams and the blog post that we've linked to has a great discussion about why none of them are quite perfect, um, but hopefully they give you a starting point. Um, so you see there's three people watching a sports game. They're standing on uneven ground. They have a different kind of amount of barrier in terms of here it's a fence, could be other kinds of barriers metaphorically in front of them. So if we just treat everyone the same and give them each the same box to stand on, um, it helps some while it doesn't help others to, to accomplish their goal, which is to be able to view this sporting event. When we start to think about equity instead, we're fo focused much more on the outcome. Um, here, can the person see over the fence? Can they witness this sporting event? Um, in our classes, that may be a variety of other kinds of things that students need more or less or some different resources to help them be able to succeed based on the barriers and the ground that they're already standing on. Accessibility typically refers um, specifically to accommodations for disabilities, but when we begin to think about a kind of universal design for learning approach, which we'll talk about in the fourth and final one of these conversations this summer, um, it also can help with accessibility for everyone. 
And then finally, there's a, an image here of people dismantling the barrier that they have in front of them, actually taking down the fence. And so when we can start to think about justice in our teaching and our educational approaches, where we perhaps identify and remove barriers, we change structures in order to be able to help everyone succeed. And when we do that thoughtfully, we're also um, often addressing inclusion, equity, and accessibility. And so just backing up a step, we want to be clear about what we're focusing on today and in this series, which is inclusive teaching. So over the past many decades and with increasing fervor and frequency over the last, I would say, two decades and, and past 10 years, especially in university um, STEM teaching, more and more evidence has become available about practices that support learning very effectively, that increase and enhance learning for students across the board. Um, and that's what we refer to generally as evidence-based teaching, right? Does it help people learn? Um, from that base of evidence, we could think about inclusive teaching practices. You could also call those equity-minded practices, which have demonstrated evidence um, that they, it, they decrease gaps in achievement between historically minoritized or marginalized groups um, and students who have traditionally been overrepresented in higher education or in particular disciplines. So in inclusive teaching practices, the evidence is there that those practices actually helps students succeed at greater rates who have historically been marginalized. You could also think about, and we would love to have conversations about this in the future, anti-racist teaching practices. Um, in the literature, we have also seen those referred to as liberation pedagogy or justice-oriented teaching. It's that dismantling the fence um, final picture from that last slide, right, where we're looking at really taking apart the structures of white supremacy and racism and other forms of oppression through the educational work that we're doing um, at the higher education level. Um, I wanted to go into a little bit of food for thought for individual reflection. So we're talking about, and we'll go back and forth today in terms of talking about transparency in assignments and transparency in course design. So I wanted you to take a moment and think about when you're creating an assignment or when you're designing a course, what's your process for doing that? And so if you have a moment, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, individually reflect or write down what's your process and choose either creating an assignment or for designing a course? What do you do? All right, so your answers may have varied from just starting writing down the questions of what I wanna ask them and get to the content to perhaps thinking about what are my goals here? How does this fit within the course? And therefore sort of working my way back in terms of backwards design with my learning outcomes and then starting to develop the course content. What I'm hoping today is that whatever you have written down, we can start to make some more nuances in terms of how you can make that more transparent and a better learning experience for your students when you're designing either an assignment or a course. So I want to start a little bit with talking about the power of goals or the power of learning outcomes. So learning outcomes articulate the knowledge and skills you want students to acquire by the end of the course or after completing a particular assignment. So by the end of this assignment, you will be able to, by the end of this course, you will be able to, you saw us begin at the beginning, Cassandra shared, by the end of this workshop, we hope that you will be able to do the following. And the, and the goal of learning outcomes are that they have four main sort of facets or characteristics. One is that they're student-centered, they focus on the student learning, they break down the task and focus on specific cognitive processes, they use action verbs, and they're measurable. So you can see what students are able to accomplish and measure that mastery by the end of the assignment or by the end of the course. And there's a lot of good impacts that creating these learning outcomes have for students, especially when they can see in terms of a course, um, what the end goal is. So it makes them a little bit more goal directed or focused. It's motivational in terms of knowing what they're going to achieve by the end of the course. And it gives them some clear expectations of what does this look like? What am I gonna be able to know and do by the end of this course or by the end of the assignment? In terms of the teacher or the instructor, it's really helpful in sort of knowing what their big rocks are. What are their main foci for the course and giving them that boundary box so this is what I really want to focus on in the course or within this assignment. So focusing on what's important. And again, I think being able to articulate those learning outcomes for the student and then articulate them for yourself 
again, means that you can be more clear when you're giving your students instructions and guidelines for how to be successful in completing those assignments or courses. I want to relate this back to backwards design or course design, where this is a key um, and the first stage of developing a course. So identifying your des desired results, the learning outcomes, this can then lead to um, designing accept acceptable evidence, what is the acceptable evidence of mastery of those learning outcomes, those learning activities, which should be the learning experiences, instructions, which are kind of assessments in disguise, kind of like carrot cake or pumpkin pie, but really are those opportunities for students to have practice and feedback for you to assess whether they understand, perhaps in terms of scaffolding for how you can build on that knowledge going forward in terms of assessments and designs, and then getting results and improving. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what the research says in terms of transparency and course design and in assignment design. So there's this project called the Transparency and Learning and Teaching Project, which is out of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, led by Marianne Wink Winkleness. And this really looks at how can we make assignments more transparent and what is the impact of making those assignments more transparent on student learning, sense of belonging in the class, and academic confidence. So she posits that by including the purpose, tasks, and criteria in our assignments, um, that students are able to have more academic sense, uh, excuse me, academic confidence, sense of belonging, and mastery of skills. So you can look at the figure on the right and see that in courses that were designed such that they were more transparent, and we'll be talking about some of the strategies to be making those more transparent in a moment, that courses that were more transparent, students had a greater level of academic confidence and sense of belonging. And this was particularly particularly seen in the underrepresented students in these classes. Oops, excuse me. There we go. So in these more transparent courses, first-gen, underrepresented, and low-income students noticed and appreciated when they knew the purpose of each assignment, how the assignment was related to the course learning outcomes, the steps required to complete the assignment, how their work would be assessed and evaluated, and then how, could the, how they could assess the quality of their work through instructor-provided tools. So numerous studies, numerous um, articles have come out where they've taken um, assignments that a professor had and literally just added the tasks and criteria and the outcomes to look at um, whether or to make the assignment more transparent and looked at the outcomes in terms of student learning sense of belonging. And they've seen a significant difference and a significant increase um, in all of those in students that had a transparent assignment or course. So let's look through this in terms of strategies you can be using for assignments, for activities, for the course. We know that learning happens when you have that opportunity for practice and feedback. Those are those formative assessments and then that final performance. And so with that practice and feedback, giving more structure in terms of making a transparent assignment or transparent activity means the students are going to be able to be more engaged and have better learning experience. So last week we learned from Cassandra in terms of transparent teaching for activities that we wanna share the purpose, the process and the product with our students. Purpose, why, what will help them learn. Process, what are you asking them to do for how long, how and product, what is the end result? We can also look at this in terms of translating it to transparent teaching for assignments. So succinctly share with students the purpose, what, why will this help them learn, real world applications and relevancy, task, what are you asking them to do, practice and or produce, and criteria, what is the measure of success? Again, we can translate this to the course as well. So looking at that research from that um, transparency and learning teaching project, we know that adding these sort of easy components when, when you're going back through that assignment process that you just wrote down, thinking through, have I shared with my students the purpose? Do, am I clear about what the task is? And have I articulated both to myself and shared with my students what is the measure of success or mastery of these skills learned in this assignment or this course? So we wanted to share a few examples with you of how you could do this in the different assignments that you might be um, sharing with your students. And we'll start with Suzanne, who's going to share about transparency in writing assignments. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Jen. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so I just want to talk through how what this looks like when you're going through this process of creating a transparent assignment uh, to include all the students in your class uh, in a writing assignment context. And that may not be the primary type of assignment that everyone here is using. We're going to get to some other examples. But I think even if you don't assign a lot of writing, this framework will be helpful for thinking about uh, what are the tacit aspects of assignments that I might bring to the surface when I'm uh, asking my students to complete a learning task. So here's an example that might come up in a class at Caltech, uh, an assignment asking students to write a review article of at least 2,000 words on a research topic in the field of astrophysics. So um, probably a you know professor or researcher in the field of astrophysics would feel like, well, what you know what more do you need to know <laughs> write a review article i've told you what the assignment is um and one of the things that particularly for me working in the writing center with my uh colleagues writing specialists and peer tutors we see of course the questions that students sometimes don't ask their tas or instructors and they bring them over to the center and part of what we do is say these are great questions we can't answer them they're actually questions about the assignment let's formulate the question and you need to take it back to your professor during office hours so one of the things that transparent assignment can do is anticipate this and give this information to students from the start. So Jen, if you want to go to the next slide, um, here are some of the types of questions that students will often come up with about an assignment like this. And I'm going to go through each of these in a little bit of detail. So uh, in fact, I won't just read through the whole list. I'll go ahead and dive in to start moving through it. So the next slide. First of all, the type of document that they're being asked to produce. Um, so what a review article is, is really clear if you've been a researcher in a field that writes in this genre for many years. But it's not a genre that most undergraduates are familiar with. And even graduate students might not be familiar with a review article. Not all disciplines have it. It looks a little bit different in different disciplines. So providing that information for students about, uh, I've told you to write an essay, for example, that'd be a different assignment. And when I say essay, here's what I mean, <laughs> because as an English professor, I might mean something different than my colleague, the philosophy professor or my colleague, the physics professor. So in this case, I think the review article isn't quite like the word essay, where that can mean a thousand things. And a review article maybe is could mean a handful of things and is just less familiar. So here on the left, you can see some of the information that an instructor might provide a relatively succinct explanation of what a review article is, what its purpose is, what its key elements are, of course, because this is kind of a complex and long piece of writing. Um, this would be a, a succinct version that could appear in an actual assignment. And of course, it would be great if this were a subject where you spent some time in class talking with students if this is an important assignment. Uh, and you can see the instructor here has noted there are a couple of models on the Canvas page for the course that the students can look at. So that's that's going to help students understand what it is that they're trying to produce. And the next slide is about who are they writing for? And so we see this a lot where students um, will, for example, leave out a lot of really important information in a piece of writing and the professor is confused. Why aren't you telling me all of these things? Well, it's because they assume that they're writing to you, the professor, and that you already know those things because you're an expert in the field and why should they have to summarize a, a paper for you that, um, that you wrote or that one of your colleagues wrote? Of course, you'll, you'll already know that. So it's about clarifying for students who's going to look at this text, uh, who's the reader that you should imagine, and three main categories here. Are they writing for someone who knows more about the topic than they do, someone who knows about the same, like a peer in the course, or someone who knows less than them, who a peer who's not in the course, a researcher in another field, um, you know, someone in a high school science club. So here I've noted with these three bullet points language that could appear in assignment, in an, a writing assignment that would give students a very specific understanding of who are you writing for? And of course, a review article written for these three different audiences would be wildly different, actually. So if you're writing something that a high school science club can understand versus something that astrophysicists in a similar in, in a research group could understand, those review articles will look 
very different in, in all ways. So that's crucial information for students. Uh, next is challenges to anticipate. Um, and part of what's important here in terms of inclusion is letting students know this work should be challenging to you. If you feel challenged by this, that's normal. That's This is a, a tough assignment. You're stretching towards learning here. So I think that's an important part of what we're doing here is normalizing that. Um, but we're also seeing how, particularly when you teach assignments again and again, you see students making some of the same mistakes or having the same challenges, going ahead and putting that into the assignment itself or talking about it when you present the assignment for the first time. So I actually do assign uh, review articles to students in my first year writing class, which is a bit of a wild thing to do because review articles are hard to write, uh, but they can do it. And But one thing that they have trouble with, of course, is how is a review article different than a textbook chapter? They both summarize the literature. So that's something that's on my assignment where I know some of them are going to have trouble with that, and, and I build that in when I present the assignment to them. Uh, next one is helping students understand how to get from the day they receive that assignment to you to the day that they've written the text. Uh, and of course, with shorter assignments, you might not need something so robust here, but with a you know, 2000 plus word uh, complicated assignment or even a lab report or uh, a proposal for something, how do you get from the blank page to the revised and polished draft? And in some classes, uh, and in, in my courses, because I'm teaching writing courses, there's a lot of scaffolding built in where I'm reading drafts and giving them feedback. That's not always possible in classes that have other learning outcomes as well. So you could do something like thinking of, how do I sketch out for students if I were to write this and I had three weeks from the time I get the assignment to when it's due, what would I be doing when? Um, and again, for folks who've written this a kind of text before, we learn this right through practice of how how do you get this done? What are the steps? What order do they come in? How long do they take? Uh, but particularly for students who may not have done as much writing earlier in their educations, uh, this is not something that will be familiar at all and it'll be a struggle. And without a map like this, they may wait too long to start or misunderstand what the focal points will be. Uh, we also want to, of course, communicate with students about how their work will be evaluated or assessed. And Jen was talking about that earlier. Um, and this is an example of a Part, a kind of adapted rubric I've used in the past. The next one of these sessions next week will focus on grading and feedback. So I don't want to get into a lot of details with this particular rubric right now, but I will just say it's in a class. It was used in a class that uses contract grading. So that's why it doesn't say, here's what you do for an A or a B or a C, or here's what you do for five points or 10 points. Those kinds of rubrics are completely legitimate too. It's just that this one corresponds with a particular approach to grading from one of my courses. Um, but what this does is it helps students understand what are my priorities as the instructor in this document. So completeness and accuracy matter a lot to me, organization and readability and citation. Um, so, and then what are the standards for what's going to get to these certain categories that I've set up in the grading system for my class. Uh, so this gives students insight into how I'm thinking about and what, what I'm looking for when I read their work and also can become a point of conversation for students who are, are confused about the feedback they're getting from me if that happens. Um, next slide, Jim. Really important uh, element, I think, of transparency and inclusion is to tell students in the assignment that you expect them to reach out for support, uh, that it's not just if you're having trouble or if you have a problem, um, that can make students feel like, oh, asking for help is what you do when you fail or you're not as good as the other students, right? But approaching it rhetorically in this way that says, I expect you to reach out for support as you work on this project. Here are the places you can get support for it. Sometimes that may just be you and your office hours. It's not anything particularly complex. For a writing assignment like this, though, having a connection with a library, with the Hickson Writing Center, those would be things I would include in an assignment like this to, to both normalize help-seeking behavior, but also uh, to give students the information they need need to think about who could help me with this. Um, and then finally, echoing what Jen was saying earlier about learning outcomes, uh, I actually put my learning outcomes on the assignment. It, 
itself. It could be something that you have more of a conversation with students about, uh, and I do when I give the assignments out, um, but I try to sell the assignments to them. I mean, here's why we're doing this. Here's what I think you will learn. Uh, here's why I think that matters. And so it's kind of dry in this bullet point form that will show up uh, in the assignment itself. I try to have a little more of a dynamic conversation with them. So they both know what we're doing, but hopefully that generates a little bit of motivation of, I'm not just trying to see that you have the competency to do this task. I'm trying to teach you something. And I think you'll learn something through the very hard work you'll be doing in writing uh, this assignment. So um, hopefully me going through these gives you a sense again of questions that I think would commonly come up for students if they just had that one sentence of the assignment. Um, and I think the more you can think about regularizing and sort of organizing the text of a, a printed out assignment or a PDF for students so that across each assignment, these elements are kind of in the same place and they get used to where to find them. That can just really help students understand what you're asking them to do. And then they've got the hard work, of course, of actually doing it, which is no small task. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and I'm going to build on, on Suzanne's example here in terms of problem sets or coding problems that you may have um, or that you may assign to your students uh, and build on that sort of same framework um, that she had. And so when I was looking at the, what, you know, a problem set might look like, um, we might start with, you know, solve the following problems and give that to our students as, as the intro to that assignment. Um, and I was thinking about what students um, what questions students might have. Um, they might want to know how many steps they need to show, what assumptions they can make, uh, what the process is for solving these types of problems, whether they can use multiple routes to the same answer, and, and will they get the same grade for that as well, uh, how their work will be evaluated, uh, what resources they can or should use, um, and what they learn from solving these problems. So what's the purpose or what are the learning outcomes? Um, why am I doing this assignment? What do I need it for? And what does this knowledge um, or what does that knowledge get me? So I was thinking through some ideas for what you might want to include or some verbiage you could include in your problem sets as well. So Suzanne before was talking about, you know, having some of those things at an easily sort of accessible place for each assignment so students know where to look. And I implore you to try and do this in your problem sets as well. So including some learning outcomes or goals for the beginning of the problem set. By the end of this problem set, you should be able to, or this problem set will help you to learn, understand, practice, solidify X concepts, or it should build on X previous concepts that you might have had in other problem sets. Um, telling students, be sure to show all your steps and or state any assumptions that you make. Um, again, normalizing, looking for resources or that they might need to you know, find more information to be able to solve these. So check out chapter X or resource X or website X for further explanations of these concepts. Um, we talked about how we'll talk a bit further about grading next week, but either sharing a rubric with your students for how it'll be graded or referring to previous problem sets or a solution set you provided where you really did lay out what that, you know, what a good solution does look like, preferably also demonstrating this in class. Please see lecture X or proof X for an example of how to solve a similar problem textbook or website for similar problems as well. So where you can show students where those resources may be, when you can demonstrate in class what a good proof looks like, what a good solution looks like, you're going to see um, them have that sort of mastery and motivation um, in doing that in their problem sets as well. And so there's a phrase that we, we often use when talking about inclusion with the rising tide lifts all boats. And so what we're hoping is that we can lift all boats by creating these transparent assignments, by by creating this transparent course design, allowing all of our students to have a better understanding of our expectations or how to do well in the course. And this will disproportionately help uh, those who are historically minoritized um, in our classes. I wanted to give one other example of well as well in terms of how to incorporate uh, concept maps into your course. Again, this is something that I've gotten a lot of feedback from my students in my E110 class, which is a pedagogy class for grad students at Caltech, that they really appreciate this in terms of 
organizing their knowledge and, and having a better way of conveying that to the students that they may be uh, instructing or TAing in their classes. And so I wanted to show you a concept map. It's a concept map so concept maps concepts uh, here, but a demonstration of what a concept map might look like. Um, and what I'd like to do in a moment is to ask you to start thinking about this for a course that you might be teaching in the fall or a course that you might teach in the future and think about some of those main concepts, the knowledge and skill that you want students students to get out of um, your course or by the end of the course that they'll be able to know and do. So uh, I'd like to take, give you a moment to do it, an individual exercise. Um, thinking about a course that you'll teach in the fall or future, draw a concept map that includes the main concepts that you teach and connections to demonstrate how you structure your knowledge about that subject. So we're going to do a little bit more sort of choose your own advancer here. Um, and then we're going to come back and talk about how you can incorporate this in your class. I'm going to give you about three or four minutes uh, to do this on your own, because hopefully this is something you can actually use and implement in your course, um, either in the fall or the future. Any questions, comments, clarifications? Okay, well, I'm sure three minutes is not enough time to put down all the concepts that you might have for your course, but hopefully it's a good start for you and starting to think about how do these match together? What are the concepts, what are the relationships between these? And maybe in terms of how you teach them and the, and the order them in which you teach them and how they relate to each other. What I'd like you to do is now take, take a moment to think back to the first time you ever took this course um, that covered the concepts that you were just sharing. Um, and, and maybe this can be, um, uh, just a quick activity, um, but thinking back or perhaps drawing that concept map that demonstrates how you think you structured that information at the time. So looking at these or reflecting on these and perhaps reflecting on what your students concept map might look like for that course. Um, in comparison to your concept map. I wanted to introduce just a few ideas to you. Um, one is the expert versus knowledge. Um, novice knowledge structure. So on the left here, we see the expert no, uh, knowledge structure. So a little bit more intricate, especially that bottom one where you see multiple relationships, things that might be related to each other in different ways. On the right, we see more of the novice knowledge structure. And this is what we see with oftentimes with students who are first learning a subject, you might see it organized as lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, or a very linear progression of we learn about this, then we learn about that, then we learn about that. And they don't necessarily, or they're not yet able to relate all of those concepts back to each other. So one thing I'd like to offer is that as you're creating that, your own concept map for your course, that you might wanna consider including that in your first class with your students and showing them how these concepts all relate to each other. And maybe referring back to that either every lecture or weekly in your course to show where you are in your course, how those concepts again relate to each other and how you're starting to build those concepts um, on top of each other. So it helps students, even if they don't necessarily understand all of those relationships at the beginning, it does help to give students a, a roadmap of the, organizing their own knowledge when they can see how you organize your knowledge. Another thing that you could do in your class is also showing your students like how I would approach this is, or if I'm giving a a given a problem like this, the first thing I do is write down what are the knowns and unknowns, state my assumptions what have you, but giving them an, again an idea of your process for solving something, your process for organizing your knowledge. Um, and, and you may or may not have seen in the difference between your concept maps and, and the short time I gave you to the draw them, um, that there might be a big difference between your concept map and what you think your student's concept map might be. This is the problem of expert amnesia. We forget what it's like when you were first learning those concepts. So I think being able to show your students your concept map, encourage them to draw their own concept maps or to build on your own gives them a roadmap of what they're going to be learning within your courses. So I think concept maps are another way of sort of peeling back that curtain and giving students a better idea as to what they're going to be learning in your class and how they can understand and learn better. So some ideas for strategies that you can use to ensure that students are clear on the expectations of the course, um, in addition to how to be successful. So how can you offer them that roadmap, concept map, benchmarks, signposts for doing so? 
some ideas. Uh, share your learning outcomes at the course and the assignment level. Suzanne shared that she um, includes this on every assignment that she gives to her students. Share the motivation and the purpose of the assignment. I think that's something that we hear back so often from our undergrads is that they're given an assignment and they don't necessarily know how it fits in the course or why it's useful or it feels like busy work. So being able to give them some more sort of meaty information as to why it's useful for them or how it's building or how they can use it in the future, real world applications really gives them more motivation into sort of diving in and doing the assignment itself. Uh, share your process for solving problems, writing essays, developing a project. Be thoughtful in your assumptions about prior knowledge and experience of your students. Uh, survey your students for information and feedback. Uh, don't assume, as Suzanne said, that your students know what the product should look like. So if you're giving them an essay, you're giving them a project, you're asking them to design a product, give them some examples and some guidelines as to what that looks like. Offer more resources for learning. Uh, offer assignment zeros, especially in CS. We've seen that students have really appreciated an assignment zero that's not great Graded, or at least not for grades, where they have an opportunity to make sure that their uh, prior knowledge is what's sort of being assumed for the class. Uh, scaffold assignments and conceptual learning, practice and feedback opportunities, and encourage reflection and feedback with guiding questions. So just some ideas for strategies that you can incorporate into your class to make it more transparent. So my question to you, we'll do a chat box flood. If the previous strategies were incorporated into a course that you were taking, what impact would it have on your learning and sense of belonging? So a chat box flood is when you are posed a question in class. Uh, you ask your students to please type their answer in the chat box, but do not press enter until you, as the instructor, say go. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to do this now. Please think and write your answer in the chat box answer to this question, if the previous strategies were incorporated into a course that you were taking, what impact would it have or could it have on your learning and sense of belonging? I'll give you a few moments, write your answer into chat. Reduce self-questioning or doubt, better sense of belonging, more effective learning, less worried about asking questions that show I don't understand something. Strategies to help me understand the purpose of the course, to help me connect with peers, to share ideas and strategies. And, and I would offer that these are all great in addition to doing something like a chat box flood where students can see, does everyone else, or a poll in your class where students can also see, oh, no one else um, knows how to do this, or we all have questions about what the process is. Um, I think this does help to give students a better sense of belonging, as you've all shared in the chat box flood. So thank you so much for sharing those. Uh, we're going to do quick breakout rooms and end with sort of an opportunity for you to ask questions, share um, what your challenges might be, solidify the concepts you've already learned, um, and, and hopefully come back with some more resources that we can share out as a large group. So this is a little bit of a choose your own adventure. Uh, we're going to go into three breakout rooms. You can choose which breakout room you'd like to go into. Uh, first is on developing transparent writing assignments, second STEM assignments, and third developing transparent courses and inclusive syllabi. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we're back. Thank you so much for engaging in your rooms. Um, we went a little bit over time. It sounds like the conversations were going uh, very well. We certainly had a, a great discussion in ours about STEM assignments. Um, so I think in terms of being thoughtful about time, we won't report back out, but I just wanted to end um, by thanking you so much for your engagement, as well as sharing these resources. Um, as you saw before, we've got the box folder online, so you can share with, um, or check those out at any time. Um, and we're more than happy uh, to to consult with you um, about STEM assignments, writing assignments, course design, um, and transparency as a whole. So thank you so much for joining us all. And thank you, Suzanne and Cassandra, co-facilitating. Thanks all.